Okay. Well, we, we've got a, a guest preacher with us this morning. Yeah. Pastor Bubba, will you stand? <laughs> Pastor Bubba McCann's come to us all the way from Louisiana. He's a friend of the house. He's been uh, twice before, three times before. Came to a conference we did a while ago, a few years ago. He preached last year for us. And so he's a great friend. He's a great man of God. Um, but more importantly than all that, it is his birthday today. So we're going to sing happy birthday to him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Pastor Boba. Happy birthday to you. Did we film that? Oh, okay. We'll send that to his church. We'll send it back to his church. We'll, we'll tell his church we love him more than them. That's what, I, that's what other churches tell me when I visit places. And so we're very pleased to have him uh, this morning. Um, he's a wonderful man of God. God's used him greatly in Louisiana. Uh, we've met some of his family. His son, Zachary McCann, came and preached for us also last year. He's planted three churches down there in Louisiana, and he oversees all these churches, about 1,000 people in total. And uh, he's, a, he's a very humble, gentle man of God, but he's actually an apostle of God. He's someone that plants churches and oversees churches and has lots of pastors under him as well. Uh, but he's very humble, and that's why we love him so much. He's a wonderful man of God. So uh, we're going to release the children right now if they want to go out to their uh, kids' church meeting. And if there's any uh, babies with uh, nursing mothers, they can go back into the creche. And the rest of us now, we're going to welcome Pastor Bubba McCann. Thank you, Pastor. Well, it's great to be here this morning. It's my birthday. I turned 21 again. Uh, I just said at my age now, you just celebrate anniversaries. And uh, actually, how old do you think I am? You think I'm, um, don't guess. <laughs> I did that one time to a girl and I guessed the wrong, and I said, I'll never do that. I aged her about seven years. And so I learned my lesson when I was in Bible college. I said, I'll never do that again. Um, you know, it's just great to be here. Uh, I was reading a story and just thinking about my trip here, and there's a guy on a plane, and, and uh, he had this beautiful young woman sitting next to him, and he said, uh, can I ask you a question? She says, sure. She goes, what do you look for in men? And she says, well, you know, I really like American Indians. She said, they were very swift on their feet and outdoorsy kind of guys. I like American Indians. He thought, oh, well, that's good to know. And she goes, you know, I also like men that have a lot of wealth, that are rich. And, you know, I like Jewish men because they know how to work with money. And she said, but, you know, I kind of like cowboys, too. The kind that have the gun racks in the back of their truck and they drive around and they're adventurous. And he said, well, that's good to know. And she said, well, she goes, what's your name? He goes, well, my name is Gatanamo. Goldstein, but most people just call me Bubba. Anyway, just. <laughs> um, so, uh, but this morning, I, I'm, I, I count it such a privilege to be here this, with, with you this morning. And um, back home, I'm a father of six children, married for 30, 30, 33 years. I also have uh, seven grandchildren and one little granddaughter that's on her way any day. And so, uh, you know, I may get a video of what she looks like and everything else, but uh, it's such a privilege to be here. Before I do anything, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Can we do that? Because I really want the Lord to speak. I really want him to have his way this morning. And uh, why come to church and you don't hear the Lord? Father, we just come to you. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to come and that you would, you would lift up Jesus. You said if you be lifted up, that you would draw people to yourself. And Father, that's our greatest desire this morning, 
We've come to the house, O Lord, to hear from you, to have a word that transforms our lives, that we walk in one way, but we walk out differently. God, we walk out touched by you, challenged by you, stirred in our hearts to be all that you want us to be this morning. So come and have your way and speak to us through your word. Speak to us by your spirit, but exalt yourself this morning, we pray. And everybody agree with that? Say, I agree. You know that, you know that, many, how many know that we are in a war this morning? Uh, and a lot of people, a lot of Christians just are unaware of the war they're in. And what I want to do is I just want to read a portion of scripture. And it, it's in Ephesians chapter 6. And very familiar if you follow the Lord for a long time, you've heard the scripture. But it's one of my favorite verses. And, and, and Paul's speaking in Ephesians. He says, finally, say it when you say, be strong. Say, be strong. Okay, in the Lord and in his mighty power. And it says, put on the armor of God. Aren't you? I'm so glad that all of us put on our clothes this morning, aren't you? (laughs) You know, we put on and it says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil. In, our, in heavenly realms. You know, the Bible says throughout the, the Scripture, it says be strong in the Lord. I love it when they went to go and take the possession of the promised land and God said be strong. Be strong. It didn't say be strong in yourself. It said be strong in the Lord. I, and I think about that many times that we as Christians, you know, I, I love uh, an old Korean saying, he says, dirty Bible, clean Christian. Clean Bible, dirty Christian. But... Um, But when you look in the word of God and you see what happens, you see that I believe that the enemy has like a whiteboard and he's constantly trying to figure out strategies, how to get to our hearts, how to get to our minds, how to get into our relationships and how to stir things up. And the way we get our eyes focused off of God and we begin to get our eyes focused on ourselves. And many people today can't get beyond themselves to be able to see the Lord and be strong in him. And so what happens is that I believe that our struggle is not, is not against your boss. It's not against your spouse. It's not against, if you live in America, Donald Trump or here in England, you know, Theresa May. That's not your struggle. You know, your struggle. See, there's another realm that we're experiencing right now, and you know it. And it goes on to say in that scripture, it says, therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, it's not if it comes, when it comes. How many of you know that either you're in a battle, or you're coming out of a battle, or you're getting ready for a new battle? And you're going, shoot, I just got through with that last one I had. And so what happens is, it it says, and able to stand your ground. Another, the Roman soldiers would have hobnobs, what they would call modern cleats and they would begin to stand their ground and they would begin to force themselves knowing that their enemy was coming and so they would stand their ground be able to take the force of the enemy and us as Christians we need to that's why it's so important that we have a personal intimate relationship with him it's not about a religion it's about knowing the God of this book it's about knowing his name it's about knowing what he can do not only what he's done in your past what he can do in your future and see, I believe this, it's, you know, it's, it's coming. So what would, it, what would it take to start winning some battles? And that's what I want to talk about. You know, th- there's a verse that encourages me to talk about this. It's in Ephesians 5.11. It says, have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. You see, some, of, some people are dabbling in darkness. What does that mean? That means that maybe something you're watching on TV. Maybe something you're playing a video game. I don't know what it is, but whatever door you open, it allows the enemy to enter in. Whatever gr- ground you give way, he, is able, he has permission to walk in that ground that you yield to him. And for many of us, is that we, 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 we come to a point and we go, you know, that. You know, some of it today, I, I want to just expose the devil. It would be like this. It would be like the devil was taking a shower, and I would pull the curtain back, and I just want to expose him for what he is. Ah! You know what I mean? And so what happens is the devil is real. The devil's not a symbol of evil. He's not a metaphor of evil. He's not a cosmic force. He is a fallen angel. And see, in the Bible I, and there, the, uh, that I see, now Dave might have more. He's way more knowledgeable in the Bible than I am. But, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in preschool still in the Bible at 33 years. But the, the thing is, I see there's three archangels in the Bible. There's, 
there in the scriptures, Gabriel, who was like the messenger angel. He, when God would send a message to Mary or whoever, he would send Gabriel. There was the war angel, Michael, who I like reading about. He was mighty in power. And there was Lucifer. And many people think that Lucifer was actually an instrument. His body played in, from his body. It was an instrument. And what he did is he brought worship to God. And see, they all reside in heaven. An event took place that Lucifer was cast out of heaven. And many scholars believe it was between Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 2. And in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, you can go read it for yourself. But I like in the portion of the New Testament where Jesus is talking to the disciples that he sent them out. And, he, and he, they come back and they begin to report in Luke 10:18. And he said, yes, he said, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. When God had decided to fight, there wasn't a power struggle. Can I just say that? There wasn't a power struggle. He kicked him out as fast as lightning. That would like me being going into the ring with McGregor. Okay? Or Mayweather. It doesn't matter. Whatever your persuasion. It would be a two-hit fight. He would hit me and I would hit the ground. That would be the end of the fight. And so people, some people, well, the Lord put him in a headlock. The Lord, you know, the devil stumped. No, the Lord just cast him out. And see, you know, Revelation says it like this. And here's, here's kind of the description of what went on in Revelation chapter 12. And he said there was a war in heaven. Michael and the angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough. Read that. Sometimes I like butts in the Bible. It's where you put your butt in the Bible. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to earth, and his angels with him. There, this is where, is, is, that's where he's operating right now. And in John, he says he's the ruler of the world. And Corinthians says he's the God of this age. In Ephesians, he says he's prince of the power of the air. In 1 John, he says the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The devil is at war, war with us. And see, just because you don't believe it doesn't make it go away. Just, you know, the best gift I can give you today is an awareness of what's going on, of things you don't see. And so, you know, Peter says, be self-controlled, alert, your enemy... The devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in your faith. Now, in other words, the enemy prowls around. I go to Africa at least once or twice a year. We help different churches and orphanages and, we, you know, diff different things we do and through our church. And I've seen lions. And it's not like a lion in the London Zoo, a pitiful, you know, lion just, you know, throw me another steak or anything like that. These are African lions. Okay, like when you see an African lion, you go, dang, that's a lion. Okay, and what happens, and I've seen them, and I remember one day, it was one of my guys and I, we had gone there, and they took us to this lion farm. And they had this 600-pound lion. And they go, let's take a picture of you. So we turn around, and the lion's looking at our ham hocks. And, I mean, he, he kind of rushes the fence and goes, and I go, dang. I'm thinking, I mean, he had a vision taking my booty and taking it to the end of the corner and eating it. But the enemy, the Bible says that he's like a lion seeking to whom he may be. He's looking for opportunities when we least expect it. When we're not aware. When we don't see. When we open up things. All, you know, it's okay. I can, do, I can do this a little bit or whatever it is. But see, the enemy's prowling around, around. And I like, you know, the, just like in, in Matthew and in Luke, when Jesus had gone out into the desert for 40 days and he began to fast and pray, and but God began to speak to him. And, and the enemy comes at him. The first, the first thing he asked him is, are you hungry? Basically, he said, hey, I'll give you bread. But I love, you know, I, if you don't know this, Jesus was in a town called Bread, and he became the bread of life. So he was like, I don't need any of your bread. And remember, he rebuked the enemy with the word of God. And see, and I believe this, the devil has power. How much power? Can a Christian be possessed? I had that. Do you feel a Christian can be possessed? I don't think they can. Once the spirit of God lives in you, it can't house God and the devil at the same time. You, you can still be harassed. You still can be oppressed. Last night I was reading a great scripture. I was just meditating on it this morning and, and last night. And it says, the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed. A stronghold in times of trouble. Say it when you say trouble. 
Say it when you say trouble. How many of you know we all have trouble in life? Come on. How many had some trouble this week? Let's be honest. Come on. I ain't going to raise my hand in church. Let's see, not two hands. We all face trouble. You know, seven years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. Colon cancer. It spread to my liver. Stage four. It gave me 21 months to live. I'm still standing. And not by my strength, but by the power of God. You know, I mean, I had people around me just, you know, and, and I remember my friend from Africa, Willem, he said, Baba, I believe in life and not death. We pray life over you. You know, and I, and, you know, I didn't go around depressed. Oh, I got this. I just, I knew this. I knew this. And the, the same God that rescued me, the same God that saved me could heal me. Amen? Amen. It doesn't matter what you face. We all face challenges. We all face difficulties. We all face things. I'm a pastor. I've been around when people have lost their child. I've been around when people's marriages are their children. I've been there when someone took their life and you have to go minister to a family. I've been there. You know, I didn't start out religious. I didn't start out. That's the least thing. My mother was Methodist. My dad was Baptist. His mother was Jehovah Witness. Her, my mama's mama was charismatic. My mama left my dad. She married another man. He was Catholic. I didn't need religion. I needed out my state of confusion. And I met Jesus in a real way. He met me. I got felt Pastor Jacob, the uh, Brother Keith's spiritual son, Jacob Aranza, led me to the Lord. I don't go along that. Led me to the Lord 37 years ago. I got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. The next day, where I was hanging out in bars and everything, I didn't know Scripture. I just met Jesus. And I started telling people about Jesus. And that's how my journey began. And I began to travel around the United States and work in the inner cities, live in mission homes and salvation armies and minister to people all throughout the inner cities of America. And just seeing what God can do. I've seen God touch people in an incredible way. People put a never on people, but God never puts a never on anybody ever. Do you hear me? He never does. You see, I love the scripture in Ephesians. In your anger, do not sin. That's hard. He said, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. All of, okay, let's, let's just, can I just do a survey? And I want you to be really honest because the Holy Spirit's looking. How many of you have ever sinned? Okay. Okay. Pastor Dave, you've sinned? Man of God. I don't know. Lord. <laughs> I'm shocked. Anyway. <laughs> All of us have. And many times we left the door open for unresolved sin. And the consequences. See, when you give the opportunity for the enemy in our lives, he begins, even in the scripture, there's, there's, he allow, there's, a, there's a root of bitterness that can be planted in our lives. And we'll wake up the next morning. If you and your wife, if you don't resolve it at night, you wake up the next morning and the enemy's working on, on both of you in the morning. Come on. You wake up that morning and go, God, you stink and your breath stinks. God, you just, oh, I, can't, I don't want to be around you this. I mean, you wonder why you're walking through that. I have an uncle that just celebrated 65 years of marriage. And he got up and he, and he goes, and he loves the Lord and and, and he goes, you know, most people ask me and ask me and Dolly. That's just my aunt Dolly's name. She goes, you know, what's the secret? He said, well, when we got married, they got married in San Diego. He was a war. He was in the Navy in World War Two. And he said, we made a, w w commitments. We met a mate. We made a commitment. And second of all, we committed that we would never go to bed angry. Now, we've stayed up for five days, but we've never gone to bed angry. <laughs> <laughs> and I love him anyway. See, the devil is subject to our God. First John says, you, dear children, are you from God and have overcome them? Because the one who is in you, listen to me, is greater than the one who's in the world. You see, this is the best news on the planet. You know, so much of what Tracy and I deal with, we treat as spiritual, my wife and I. Let, 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 I'm not going to, let me, let me just tell you, I'm not going to say we blame the devil on everything. I'm not going to say if I run out of gas, the, sh the shell devil just kept me from getting gas. I mean, it's not. I, I forgot to get gas. You know? 
I, I think there's something going on here in the UK, in America, that is spiritual and it's not natural. I believe the Bible says you're in a fight and you need to learn how to fight. Say me, say fight. See, Corinthians says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. It'd be great if we could use AK-47, uh, AR-15. It'd be great, I mean, if we could use whatever kind of weapons and we just took out the enemy. But, uh, you know, on the contrary, they have a divine power to demolish strongholds. In other words, in this scripture, he's assuming when he writes this portion that we are fighting. Here's my question to you, and you don't have to answer it. Are you fighting? Are you making a stand? Do you realize you're in a battle? Have you given ground? Let me just tell you something. It's time to take ground back. It's time to draw the line and say, that's it. No more. No more. I know. I knew who I believed in. And the Bible says he is able. Even in my weaknesses. How many, how many of you know we all have issues in our lives? We all have weaknesses in our lives. And, and even in my weakness, if I say, God, I need you, I, I can't do this by my, I need you, that he's able to give me strength in the midst of when I'm, able, when I'm weak in. You see, in other words, a stronghold is any lie of the devil that keeps you trapped into slavery. That's what a stronghold is. It keeps you trapped. Oh, you'll never, you know, you hear those voices. Oh, you know, you will never overcome ice cream. You will always look like this. You're, ugly, you're uglier than barnacles on the bottom of a boat in the London Harbor. I don't know if they have a London Harbor. And we hear those things. And then we begin to believe the lies of the enemy. The Bible says we're fearfully and wonderfully made by the hand of God. God doesn't make junk. In other words, see, there's a part of your Christianity, and to demolish, it means to cast it down, to get rid of it, to obliterate it, that it's not there anymore. In other words, there's a part of your Christianity that's confrontational with the enemy, and you can't be afraid. One day I was coming in at lunch, and my son Zach, when he was in high school, he was get off early in, in, in his senior year of high school, and I was coming in the house to eat lunch. I was taking a break, and I was going to eat lunch, and he thought he was going to scare me. And so he goes around the corner. I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of whistling, singing, whatever. And I come around the corner, and he comes out, and he goes, ah! And I go, ah, like that. And he goes, no, Dad! <laughs> I was ready to take the fight on. <laughs> you see, what are your weapons, and how do you use them? I'm going to give you three weapons. If you don't have a pen and paper, you can write these three down, because I don't believe, you, need, you don't need to forget these. And it's simple, and I know that you'll remember them, but I believe this. The first weapon is the name of Jesus. We intentionally sang songs today boasting about the name of Jesus. In other words, what a wonderful name. What a powerful name. You know, cancer is a powerful name. Debt is a powerful name. Addiction is a powerful name. Depression is a powerful name. But I have good news for you. Philippians said, therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. At the same name, Jesus, uh, name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God and the Father. Amen? When I tell my daughter, I have five boys, and I have one girl, and she's the baby. She's 12 years old. I said, Olivia, go tell the boys it's time to eat. And she goes there, and it's time to eat. And she comes there, they're not coming. I go, t go tell them, Dad said, it's time to eat. There's authority in that name. They come to the table. And see, this is what we do as Christians. Everyone, the Bible says in, in Romans 10, 30, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Say, say will be. It doesn't say think about it. Then we'll scratch my head. We'll contemplate it. We'll make sure you're good enough. Well, you got to run through this loop. No, he said we'll be. You're, use, see, I've learned this. Use the name. You call the name. You sing the name. You pray the name. I used to, I mean, I, believe it or not, Belinda Ravenhill used to be one of my teachers. He's from Yorkshire area here. And he used to tell people all the time, because I, and he, he, he kind of teaches, you know, most people sing more lies than they tell. 
And I used to go, dang, I always watch the words before I sing now. But you're praying to God the Father in the name of Jesus. And this morning, I want to pray a prayer over you. Can we do that? Because there's some names that you've, that, that you've said or used or things that identify what you've been battling with. And so I want to pray over those names. And I want to pray the name of Jesus. Have power and glory in your life. Can we do that this morning? Just bow your head and lift your hands to heaven. And it just says, Heavenly Father, we just bow and praise and worship before you. I surrender myself in this church completely, unreservedly, in every area of our life to you. We take a stand against the enemy. We resist all the endeavors of Satan and his wicked spirits to rob us of the will of God. So in the name of Jesus, I take authority over bitterness, over unforgiveness, over resentment, hate, malice, envy, jealousy, insecurity, fear, rejection, self-pity, self-hate, anger, rage, murder, Violence, sexual immorality, impurity, adultery, adultery, fornication, lust, pornography, pride, lying spirits, rebellion, deception, manipulation, control, criticism, judgmentalism, arrogance, prejudice, racism, greed, materialism, selfishness, covetousness, depression, anxiety, worry, suicide, addiction. Alcoholism, drunkenness, obesity, false doctrine, stealing, laziness, humiliation, witchcraft, blasphemy, sickness, and disease, and chronic health. I declare in the name of Jesus is higher than you. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. He's worthy this morning. He is the name above every name. Amen? There's no other name. The second weapon that we have is the Word of God. Say it. Say the Word. The Word word of God has power. You see, for the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The sword is an offensive weapon. It's, It's the only offensive weapon in the armor of God. Ephesians says, stand firm then with the belt of truth. You know what belts do? They hold everything up. The, the belt that buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness. It means, I love the word righteousness. I remember when I was young, I said, Pastor Jake, what does righteousness mean? He goes, this just mean right choices. You make right choices. You made put those right choices over your heart. And, and you'll eat the fruits of them. And with your feet fitted with the, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. For which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know, the Bible isn't a nice little thought. It's a weapon. Treat it like one. You know, I read the Word and sitting in my back porch the other day and even last night, this morning, reading. I don't read. I don't read. I make a commitment. I made a commitment. I don't read to get a message to preach. I read to hear God speak. Do you hear me? And I'll read the word. I read the word every day. I read the word every day. I make it a practice in my life because I want to be strong in the Lord, not strong in Bubba. Because I have words I could say. But I, sometimes I read it. And the Bible, I love what David says taste and see that the Lord is good. And you know, sometimes I'll get my Bible, I'll finish, and I'll just I'll kiss it. It's kind of like eating good food when you're back home. You eat Cajun food. You'll eat Cajun food. Let me, the real Cajun food is so good, you'll kiss yourself. You, you just blessed yourself so much, it was so good. <laughs> you see, you need to treat it like a weapon. Luke says, I have given, I've been given authority and power over all the enemy, and nothing shall harm me. See, what I, if it's a weapon, here's what needs to happen. You need to read it. You need to learn it. And you need to use it. Wouldn't it be amazing if we walked in the room and there was a spiritual indicator over the door and it registered one through ten and it measured how much you've been up in the word? Some of you would look look like an Ethiopian poster child with his little bowl hanging out. Feed me! (laughs) It's funny, but it's sad. But as Christians... 
You know, see, the enemy wants to keep you from this because he knows it's a mighty weapon in your arsenal. And so read it, learn it, use it. So the first weapon is what? The name of Jesus. The second weapon is the word of God. And the third and final weapon is this, the power of the cross. What do you mean? The ultimate, the ultimate defeat of the devil. Most people think the cross was just to pay for my sins. But there was something that happened between Friday and Sunday. They put Jesus in a tomb on a Friday. They plucked his beard. They put a crown of thorns on him. They beat him with a cat of nine tails, and they thought, we've done it. Let's put him in this tomb. Let's roll the rock, and that's it. But that was Friday. But he didn't know something was happening. And so Friday, the religious leaders thought they had wiped out their problem, this Jesus and his followers. But that was Friday. But I like what a, a, an old African-American preacher back in America said, that was Friday, but Sunday was a coming. You see, Friday they put him in the grave, but Sunday we know. Anybody got a set of keys? Anybody got some keys? I need some keys. Throw them here. I catch. Go ahead, throw them. I'm, I play baseball. Come on. Come on. I didn't play cricket, but I played baseball. <laughs> These are keys. Keys unlock things. If you put this key, I, let's see, what kind of car am I driving away with a Kia? <laughs> anyway. And, uh, uh, but keys unlock things, it has the power. To bring power to the ignition, to get that little fire and that spark plug to make those engines, those pistons move. And what happens is we know most people, you see, between Friday and Saturday, Jesus descended in the pit of hell. And he took away the keys of hell, death, and the grave. In other words, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to say he pimp slapped the devil and said, they're my keys. I'm going to take them back. And what he did, he said, I've given, I have power and authority over every individual. The Bible says in the, uh, Revelation, he says, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. In other words, Jesus amened himself. Jesus now confronts the enemy. Uh, it controls eternal destiny. Here, I'm gonna, I'll give you a card back. I feel like a donation happened. And there you go. Anything the devil throws at you, Jesus has already won. Let me just say this. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. It's a big difference. There's a lot of Christians going, like, man, you know, one day I'll overcome. No, he's already overcome. You just got to remember, you know what? He's won the battle. I'm in it. I'm just a fellow soldier, and then he's with me. It's kind of like going to the fight, and, you know, you think you're by yourself, and your big brother shows up. ha, <laughs> ha. You see, I believe this in the scripture that we, you quoted a while ago. Revelations is amazing. It's God, but a Revelation 12, 11. They overcame by the blood of the lamb. That was a scripture that I used when I walked through cancer, when I had 21 months to live. I said, Lord, it's your blood. Your blood washes me. Your blood cleanses me. Your blood heals me. By your stripes, I'm healed. And he said, they overcame by the blood and their testimony. You know what testimony is? Testimony means you've been through a test. And you have a story about the test that you have to tell about to the world. Come on. Let me ask you. How many you got a testimony? Come on. You have, you, how many of you have been through a test? In America, they do these weather tests every once and they put on the TV. This is a test. This is only a test. They have those here in England. And they go, only, and I like, I'd like to have one. Wouldn't it be great if God came back? This is only a test. This is only a test of the eternal broadcasting system. This is a test. Wouldn't it be great? But it don't happen that way. But see, I've learned this, is it, and they did not count their lives. during. The, you just say your testimony. You want your testimony? I'm saved. I'm healed. I'm delivered. I'm transformed. I'm blessed. But I know with some people in their mind, but Pastor Webber, you don't know what I'm going through. No, I don't. But Romans says, does it, does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted or hungry or desolate or in anger, threatened with death? And all these things, we are more than overcomers. 
When I think about that, I think right now, throughout many parts of the Middle East and parts of Africa, there are more, in China, there are more Christians, Christians, followers of Jesus, that are being put to death than any other period in our time for their walk and their stand with Jesus. And we can sit in America or you can sit in the UK and we can sit on our chairs and say, and sit on our blessed assurance and say, everything's fine, Jesus is mine. But when it's all you have and it's all you are and you have to make a stand, there's a big difference. Because sometimes we don't realize what, when we use the name, we don't know what we're really doing in the, in the, the spiritual realm. When we use the word, it's kind of like, how many of y'all saw Karate Kid, the first part, the first one, with Mr. Miyagi? You remember that? And, it, it, and I like, I, this, is, this is what I call Miyagi Christianity lesson, okay? Remember, he's so frustrated, he's, he's like, he gets that scene to me, Mr. Miyagi, you're using me. I mean, you just wax on, wax off. I mean, you're, all your cars are clean, your house is clean, you've used me. And all Daniel-san, no. <laughs> he goes, Daniel-san. Wax on. Daniel son, wax off. And all of a sudden he began to see all the testing, all the trials, and all the things he was walking through. And in, in the meantime, he was teaching him a lesson how to fight, and he didn't even know it. And see, when the word when the enemy comes and you're hidden in the word of God and you're using the name and you're covered by the cross, come on, listen to me. It's like wax on, wax off. Word of God. Are you hearing me? And see, what happens, it's not just the cross, but the Bible says this, that Jesus endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. When he said joy, that's you. Put your name in for whatever. For the joy set before him. You know that God loves you? I don't care what your uncle, your aunt, I don't care what side of the river, what kind of the bridge, what side of the, the uh, you know, what township you're from. I don't care where you're from. God loves you. And he demonstrated his love well, yeah, while we were just doing our own thing, that Christ died for us. It wasn't just the cross, but he overcame. The Bible says the same power that raised him from the dead dwells in you and I. Come on. You got something to stand up and talk about. You have something to say. You have a testimony. And you know what? I believe this. You have weapons. You have the name of God. You have Jesus' name. You have his word. And you have the power of the cross. See, when we trust God in difficult times, our stumbling blocks become stepping stones. I believe that. When, when we face our deepest fears, our faith, our faith grows because we find God to be faithful. I've learned this. You can either be stuck on your fears or you can say, Fat God, I put my faith. I don't see it. I don't know where it's coming from. But I'm trusting you. When doubts cloud our minds, it's time to refocus on God's grace. His greatness. His wisdom. And his ability to get us out of any situation. If I could do anything for you as a church this morning, that I would hope that you would take those weapons and you'd walk out these doors today and begin to use those weapons that you would use the name of Jesus, it's above every name. They would use this incredible word that people died for. Even, even here in England, Latimer and Ridley, they stood on a corner and they were burned at the stake for a Bible. And they said, I want to go to the spot. Dave probably knows where it is. I don't know. And I remember one of my favorite stories. And he said, Latimer, for today, we mark a spot. They may burn us, but today we will make a spot that will change England. And on some little corner somewhere in, in your country, there's a little X that marks the spot that we're burned at the stake. Because they, they just printed the word. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for everyone here this morning. Thank you for this wonderful church, Bethel Community Church. Thank you for your, their wonderful pastor and his wife and many people that are here today. And Lord, I thank you that you have not, you have not left us, if you have not forsaken us, but you're with us today. You're speaking to our hearts. And I pray that we would just simply respond to what you want to do in our hearts this morning. Maybe you're here this morning, you've been in struggle, and you've, the battles just seem overwhelming. And 
and you've lost focus. But today, maybe this message is saying, you know, Pastor Bob, I, I, I'm reminded to be focused once again. That my help comes from the Lord. It's nothing I can produce, nothing I can do on my own. But I need to trust him like I've never trusted him before. If that's you, just raise your hand real quick and I'll pray with you. Just okay. Anyone else all over? I mean, don't look around, please. Just thank you. Thank you. That's okay. Put it down. That means you're in a fight. You're struggling. That means you're fighting for something. You're fighting for ground. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Many, many people. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Baba, I'm really not following God like I should. I really don't. I know my, my, where I'm at in my heart, it's, it's a scary place. In fact, I really don't feel like I even know the Lord and I really want to give my heart to Jesus this morning. Would you pray for me that I would just meet God, that I'd meet him in a real way this morning? If that's you, just raise your hand and I'll pray for you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. You can put your hands down. Anyone else? If you're struggling, let's just pray this prayer. Father, right now, I thank you that we're all in a fight. We're all comrades together in this fight of faith. And for those that the enemy has blinded their minds and their hearts, I pray that as you've opened their eyes this morning, I pray they begin to see like they've never seen before. And Lord, that they would begin to allow to see themselves as God, your creation. That they can depend upon you in strength and grace and power. They cannot overcome it in themselves, but they can overcome it through you and with people that stand with them. If you raise your hand this morning, can we just all pray this prayer together out loud? Let's pray with them that raise their hand to give their hearts to say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe, you're the son of, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe on the cross you took my guilt, my sin and my shame. You died for it. I believe you faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, I turn from my sin to be born again. I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap. Come on. Praise God. Praise God.